Good morning. Welcome to Roswell Presbyterian Church. Whether you are sitting in the room with us or you are joining us online, this is the perfect day. You picked the perfect day for us to be able to worship together. There's a lot of really special things we're going to get to do together. We're welcoming back our senior pastor, Jeff, from his paternity leave. It's just a great day. So I'm so delighted that you are here, that we're able to worship together. So let's take these next couple moments and prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of all creation. Bless God's holy name. Praise the Lord, who over all things so wondrous, wond wondrously reigns. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, and let all that have life and breath bring their praise. With all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Join me in glad adoration. Let us sing our praise. Friends, let's stand together and sing, Praise ye the Lord, the Almighty.
You may be seated. Scripture tell us that all, tells us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but also assures us that we have a God who hears us when we confess our sins. And we get to do that then today as a family of faith, a body of Christ, we can approach the throne of grace together. So we'll do that using the prayer in front of you. Friends, let's pray together. O oh Lord, our God, we confess that we often fail to reflect your glory we have not prepared our hearts to receive the gift of your word. We allow thorns and weeds to grow in the places where you plant the gospel. Forgive us, restore and reorder our lives by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Accomplish all that you desire in us so that we may bear good fruit to the glory of your holy name. Amen. So the scripture asks the question, then because we are a people who sin, who is in a position to condemn? It's only Christ. And Christ, instead of condemning us, intercedes for us, reconciling us back to one another and to God. Friends, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite the Hart family to come forward along with Marilyn Melly, our ruling elder for the sacrament of baptism. Quentin and Yinmi, this is a really important day. It's a special day for a whole lot of reasons. I appreciate that we get to be together for another very holy moment in your family's life. It's an important day because today you all are going to make promises on Stefano's behalf. Today you're going to promise to, to pray for him and to grow him up knowing the God who loves him so much. You all are going to make promises that you're going to walk alongside of the Hart family, that you're going to teach Stefano's Sunday school class and go with him on mission trips and be his confirmation mentor, that, that we're going to, to teach him about the God who loves him so much. But of course, most of all, what we're celebrating are the promises that God has already made and continues to, to make on y'all's behalf. Scripture tells us that there's not anything that we can do to put us out of the reach of God, to, to separate us from God's love. And so we'll celebrate today that the Spirit has claimed you, has claimed Stefano as God's very own. And also, in a, in a time like this, this is just such a beautiful reminder of life and hope and faith that God gives us in a time where there are so many that are hurting. Here, we celebrate that God continues to be at work, and we give thanks for that. So as an indication then of the promises that you all are going to make, I'll start with you, Quentin and Yinmi. Do you reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? And do you claim God's covenant promises on your child's behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation as you do for your own? And do you promise, in humble reliance upon God's grace, to step before Stefano an example of the new life in Christ? And do you promise to pray with him and for him and to bring him up in the knowledge and love of God? Quintessa, I'm going to ask you some questions. Is that okay? Like I asked mom and dad. Do you promise to be a good big sister to your brother? Cool. 
And also, you can tell him about the stories from the Bible, and you can help him make sure that he knows that God loves him. Okay? Perfect. <laughs> and Marilyn. And to you, the congregation, I would ask these two questions. Do you, the members of this congregation, and all believers everywhere, in the name of the whole Church of Christ, undertake with Quentin and Yenmi in the Christian nurture of Stefano, so that in due time he may confess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you? We do. Will you, by your example and fellowship, endeavor to strengthen their family ties and with the household of God? Will you? Then let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for this day, for this moment. Lord, we stand in awe of who you are and of the way that you love us, the gifts that you give us. But most of all, Lord, for the way that you claim us unto yourself and you promise that there's not anything that we can do, Lord, that, that takes us out of your grasp. And so we give thanks today for the Hart family. God, we pray that you would continue to equip them, Lord, that you would nurture them, that you would walk alongside of them in their own family, that you would help them to know you and, and make all of their, they would journey with you in a way that they would trust you. God, we pray for Stefano. We pray that this would be a special, holy, and set-aside time. God, that here we would remember how much you not love, that you love not only him, but that you love all of us as well. Here, Lord, we celebrate that you have claimed him unto yourself. And from now on, every time he runs through the sprinkler or drinks a glass of water, we will be reminded of this sacred, special, and holy day. So God, set aside this part, this water, for a sacred and holy use. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Can I hold you? Mm. Hi. Do you want to see the water? Do you see the water in there? Okay. Stefano James, child of the covenant. One more time. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and I will take you home with me. <laughs> Truly, this is a special day. Friends, let's stand and sing together and welcome Stefano to the family of faith. Oh. be seated. You did such a good job. Stefano, I want you to know that the scripture tells us that God has called you by name and you belong to God. Oh, do you want to touch it again? Okay. Oh. This might be my favorite ever. <laughs> so I believe then that your name is important and your parents gave you such a beautiful name. The name Stefano actually means crown, and there's this beautiful scripture in the Psalms that says, for the Lord takes delight in his people, and he crowns the humble with victory. <laughs> Do you want to touch the water too? Yeah. And so we will remember certainly that God has claimed you to, unto God's self, and may there never be a day that you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Thank you. Thank you. So good. What a very special day for Stefano and the entire family, claimed by God, known by God. 
It's my privilege today to introduce to you the newest members of our church family. Uh, they joined before the session today and, and got to make promises on behalf of Stefano today as well. They are Amanda uh, and Blair Cash, and I'd like for them to stand. They have with them today the, uh, what I'm going to call from now on, the A-team, <laughs> Avery and Addison, who are four, and Amelia, who is two. Uh, they're down here with them today. Uh, they are in charge of this family. They joined by reaffirmation of faith, and we are delighted to have you folks. We know that, uh, that this congregation will go from strength to strength, uh, because you are a part of it. We look forward to, to many years of ministry and mission in and from this place with you beginning today. Welcome. We are glad you are here. If you wish uh, to join this family of faith uh, or consider joining the next uh, class is in person on February 13th at, at 9.15. We do have members joining from outside the local area. If you've been worshiping with us uh, for some time, or if this is your first day, we invite you to join, uh, either in person or virtually. Uh, if you'd like to contact Stephanie Jacobs, she would be delighted to tell you how this is possible. We are delighted in these new members, and we would be delighted to welcome you into our family of faith. It's also a joy to call your attention to these uh, two red roses that are on the pulpit today. Uh, they welcome uh, new babies born into our congregation. First, uh, Blakely Ann Hendricks, the new daughter of Paul and Jamie Hendricks, was born on January 17th. Uh, and we certainly welcome Blakely into God's church. We also welcome another new baby who was born way back in December, December 27th. But we wanted to wait until today to let you know and to welcome her uh, because we wanted to make sure that, uh, that her daddy heard us do this because if he didn't, he would, we would hear about it. Uh, and that is uh, Memphis Mem... Quiros Myers, uh, our own Jeff and Courtney's uh, and Big Brother Major's new baby uh, who was born back in December. We are delighted for these mamas and daddies and families and, and these babies, and we love to watch them as they grow in God's love and God's protection. Did you hear that? Okay. <clears throat> And now let us join together in fellowship and prayer. The Lord be with you. Great God of ancient story, of, of present living word, and of course of what is to come. We praise you that, that you revealed yourself long ago through, through patriarchs and prophets through matriarchs and judges and those who called you their own. And then in the fullness of time, you revealed yourself to the whole world through the teachings, the stories of Jesus. Today we celebrate those lessons and stories being made, to know, made known to us through through your word read and explained and heard and sung and, and shared and felt. And we pray also that we celebrate your word through our personal encounter with you. Enable us, we pray, in the moments ahead to be, to be pliant that your word may work its way into us for our benefit and for the building up of others to your glory. 
as you give us your word through stories of life, stories that, that challenge and correct, instruct and assure and comfort and encourage. We remain grateful to those who uphold the importance of teaching and learning in the church. Lord, we treasure your word to us, always being open to the, to the continuing revelation through the Holy Spirit, through the interpreting of that word for our time and our lives, for, for your church in this day and in the coming days and for the world in which we live, a world so very much in need of hearing that word and acting upon its lessons. Give us, we pray, a willingness not only to hear what is said, but to take it into our hearts and our minds. And as difficult as it sometimes may be to let our lives be, be changed, that, that we may be witnesses by our words and our lives. And that those to whom we look for guidance and leadership may be uh, the ones who bear forth the truth and good news of Jesus Christ as, as relevant, even as that truth and good news in the, in the life and words of Jesus was relevant in the lives of the first hearers. Help us, we pray, to lead others, to lead others to discover those words and the healing power and the grace to live and serve in the name of the one who taught us, who teaches us, and who leads us to pray using these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, again, welcome to Roswell Presbyterian Church. It is great to be in worship with you. We're so glad you're here. I want to say a special thank you to everyone who's been so kind praying for us, uh, sending cards, well wishes. We feel super blessed uh, to welcome them, not only into our family, but also into the faith family here at Roswell Presbyterian Church. We feel such a joy and honor uh, to have such a loving, welcoming community. I'll be honest with you, um, we are very thankful that she's an expressive uh, baby. I, you know, the Proverbs say pride goeth before a fall, and I know a, a number of the staff put on their prayer list after I was a little pompous about how I'd figured it all out with Major, he was perfect, sleeping through the night, it was all great, that now um, their prayers have been answered. <laughs> so we're having a good time. I, I want to thank the pastors who stepped in over the past few weeks for preaching for us, who closed out. 2021, and then launch this new sermon series for this year, The Short Stories of Jesus. We're looking at the parables of Jesus. Today we're going to look at the parable of the sower. This word parable is a conjunction of two Greek words. You have para, which literally means uh, alongside. This is where we get the word parallel, right? And then the second half is balo, literally means to, to throw or to cast. So it's to cast alongside. A parable is something that you cast alongside your life, creation, nature, and it's meant to show you something you couldn't see otherwise. So let us now see how God might speak to us through the parable of the sower that we throw alongside our lives today. 
Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Luke 8, verses 4 through 15. When a great crowd gathered and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell on the path and was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some, of the, some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered for lack of moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. Some fell into good soil, and when it grew, it produced a hundredfold. As he said this, he called out, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. Then his disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But to others I speak in parables, so that looking they may not perceive, and listening they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones on the path are those who have heard, and the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root, and they believe only for a while and in a time of testing fall away. As for what fell among the thorns, these are the ones who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. But as for that in the good soil, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask that in the next few moments you might be our teacher, that you might speak a word to our hearts that only you can speak, or that you might help us see in ways that we haven't been able to see previously. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you recognize the light of Christ? Are you able to see what's right in front of you? In 1888, the Dutch painter, Vincent van Gogh, painted one of his most famous paintings based on this parable called The Sower. Against a backdrop of a yellow sun shining its luminous light, the sower throws out seed almost willy-nilly. He throws it wherever it will go. He throws it on the path where it might be trampled down. He throws it on the rock where it's too hard to take root. He throws it among the thorns who choke it out. He tosses it on the good soil where hopefully it will take root and flourish. And in the background, there's a yellow sun shining down, catching everything in its radiant light. For Van Gogh, the sun represented the kingdom of God, the presence of the divine in nature. The yellow sun stands in beautiful contrast to the blues and greens of the field. The yellow sun shines forth with the glory and beauty of God. Van Gogh chose this yellow for very specific reasons, but I'll get back to that. The sower is what we might call a meta parable. That is, it's a parable about parables. Jesus says the good news of God is right there for us to see if we'll have eyes to see it. We have what we might call a promiscuous sower throwing seed wherever it wants to go with little regard for whether it will be received or not. He's taking the let a thousand flowers bloom approach. The sower just sows seed and sees what will happen. Maybe it will take root, maybe it won't. But you don't know if you don't try. I'm reminded of what Michael Scott said you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. <laughs> and the sower agrees. God is a God who takes risks. I'm going to spread the good news whether people receive it or not. Now, most commentators, when they approach this parable, focus on the qualities of the places where the seed is sown. 
They look at the path and they say, how can we prevent our hearts from being trampled down so the seed doesn't get in? How can we avoid becoming like the rock with hardened hearts that the good news can't take root? How can we be good gardeners rooting out the thorns of our lives? How can we have fertile soil so the seed will flourish? But I wonder if that's really what the parable is about. Did you notice what Jesus says when his disciples come to him and ask him why he teaches in parables? Listen to this, verse 9. Then his disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to to others I speak in parables. Why? He says, so that, and then he quotes from the prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament. So that, looking, they may not perceive, and listening, they may not understand. Jesus seems to be saying that he teaches in parables so people won't understand. That seems very strange. Why would the greatest teacher that ever lived teach so people couldn't understand? One of the most influential filmmakers of the 20th century was a French minimalist named Robert Bresson. Bresson directed Diary of a Country Priest, Al Hazard Balthazar, Pickpocket, among others. If all you ever watch are popcorn films, you might think Brazon's films are boring. I remember the first time I watched Diary of a Country Priest for a religious film class. The movie follows a whiskey priest. He's addicted to alcohol. And he suffers from depression, self-loathing, the entire film, wondering if his ministry will flourish, if he's, if he's inadequate, if he's a complete failure. And by the end of the film, you as the viewer are just worn out asking, how can I get those 90 minutes of my life back? (laughs) The next class, students gathered around, and we were all complaining. Was that the most boring movie you'd ever seen? Yes, by a long shot. How much boring could it get? No more boring. It was the platonic ideal of boring. And then the professor gets up. He says, I hear all you talking about how you thought the film was boring. Did you ever wonder why Bresson might have intentionally made the movie boring? Did you ever ask why he made the film like that? And I was like, (laughs) and the professor says this, Bresson loved Blaise Pascal. And Pascal, one of the great themes of his writing and thought is that human beings are often given over to distraction, that they focus in on entertainment, what is not important, what is superfluous in life, and they never focus in and give attention to what is most important. And the professor said this, if you find yourself bored in the movie, the film is critiquing or judging you that you're unable to focus in a sustained way in what's most important. Brazon famously said, hide the ideas, but so that people find them. The most important will be the most hidden. And I believe Jesus' parables function in much of the same way. They're not always meant to be clear and easy to understand, instructing and informing us. No, oftentimes they're meant to cause a response. There's stuff in our lives that is hiding, hidden in plain sight that the parables are helping us see about ourselves, about the world, and about God. These stories sometimes will cause us to get angry to get frustrated, to self-reflect, to stir our emotions. There is a long Jewish tradition of parables functioning like this in the Old Testament. Hundreds of years before Jesus, the most famous king in all of Israel was King David. At the height of his power, he began to abuse and misuse his power. In fact, he took a woman who was not his wife, 
took her as his own and had her husband murdered. Nathan the prophet finds out about this and God calls him to go and confront David. He knows he cannot come and just confront David straight away. David is much too powerful, could have him executed, banished, who knows. So what Nathan decides to do, the prophet decides to offer a parable. He said, David, once there was a poor man who had a lamb, who raised the lamb from birth on as a member of his family. And next to the poor man lived a rich man, and a visitor came to visit the rich man. And the rich man went across the street to the poor man's house and took the lamb and had it slaughtered and served for dinner. David becomes apoplectic, indignant at this injustice. How could this happen? How dare this rich man take advantage of a poor man using his power and privilege in this way? And then Nathan says two of the most famous Hebrew words in the Old Testament. He says, ha aish, in other words, you are the man. Nathan says this parable I've just shared with you, it's critiquing you, you are the man. And it forces David to see what is in the plain sight of his life, but he's been unable to see the injustice he has perpetrated, the evil he has done. And because Nathan has offered a parable, David sees his complicity in injustice, sees his own sin, and it causes David to repent. The parable helps him see what is in plain sight of David's life. And that's how the parables function, to help us see. Sometimes it's difficult. I remember during my first few months of grad school, I was playing basketball with some friends, and we came outside the gym. One of the guys who was driving home had this car, and there was a bumper sticker on it. It said, Eschew Obfuscation. And one of the our friend says, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> and have you ever like laughed at something, but you don't know why it's funny? I was like, oh, 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 oh. that's a good one. I go home, I get my dictionary out. <laughs> e, eschew, deliberately avoid using, abstain from. What? Obfuscation, the action of making something obscure, unclear, or unintelligible. Oh, that is funny. It's saying, it's using obscure words to say, don't be obscure. Oh, the irony. This is especially funny for a seminary student whose job security would rely on making simple things appear complicated. (laughs) But that bumper sticker caused and demanded a response. That's how the parables function. They wake us up from our slumber, from our spiritual sleepwalking, and hopefully wake us and make us alive to our lives. Part of what it means to be human is to wake up to be on the lookout for the true, the good, and the beautiful. But we are often sunk in everydayness. We're distracted from what's most important. We're busy, and we never focus in on what's most important, even those who are right in front of us. One of the saddest examples in my mind that comes to mind is Leonard Cohen's song, Famous Blue Raincoat. At the end of the song, Cohen signs off with it, sincerely, L. Cohen, he says, so that everything that's come before is a letter, autobiographical description of his life. It's a personal song about a woman named Jane whom he loved but eventually lost. And toward the end of the song, he speaks to someone who had helped set her free, and he says this, yes, And thanks for the trouble you took from her eyes. I thought it was there for good, so I never tried. It's an admission that he failed to see what was right in front of him, to really see, to really pay attention. He was going through the motions of his relationship. How many people I've met over the years who've been married for 
for years who wake up one day and say, oh, the, the person on the pillow across from me, I don't even recognize anymore. And I find that so sad to fall asleep to the beauty, to the person, the people in your life. How can we avoid falling asleep? How can we not sleepwalk through life? I think Van Gogh's painting the sower might offer us a clue. Many people don't know that Van Gogh was raised in the church. In fact, he wanted to be a minister. In fact, his father and his grandfather were both ministers. In his training, he had transformative ministry among coal miners. When he come up, came up before the governing board for ordination, he was denied because they said he wasn't a good enough preacher. Through that event, Van Gogh rejected the institutional church, and he said, I will minister through my painting. And one of the features of Van Gogh's paintings is the way he imbues common objects, stars, flowers, sowers, seed, with a numinous or luminous sacred quality. Through these co common elements, Van Gogh says, the kingdom of God is breaking in. And he uses this famous yellow that he's so known for to symbolize the divine, sacred quality of life, the kingdom of God, God's presence breaking into our lives. So where did he come up with this shade of yellow? Well, Van Gogh, one of his favorite painters was a French painter named Delacroix. He painted a painting in 1853 called Christ Asleep in the Tempest. In the painting, the waves appeared almost to overwhelm the boat. You can see the, the fear on the faces of the disciples. You can see one of the disciples reaching for an oar, another trying to steer the boat with the rudder, the terror on each of their faces. And what stands out in this image? is Christ in the boat, and then you'll see his head with a halo of yellow around it. Van Gogh takes that yellow found in Christ and says that is illuminating all of creation. The yellow that radiates from Christ in the boat will radiate love and beauty in the world. The Christ who has the power over the wind and the waves, who radiates peace and grace and love. It is this same yellow that Van Gogh uses in his painting of the sower, saying, look out at nature, look out at the world. The Word of God is out there. God is present to us if you will have the eyes to see. And the parables are gifts to us, they're, they're guideposts to wake us up, to help us see what is right in front of our eyes. Maybe God is trying to speak to you through a neighbor, a friend, a family member. Maybe God wants to speak to you through work of art, a book, a movie, music. Maybe God wants to speak to you through starry night, a sunset, Maybe God wants to speak to you through someone who asks you for money as you walk down the street. God is sowing the Word of God throughout your life. May you have the eyes to see it and to flourish for the sacred divine presence, the radiating light of Christ is all around us. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this great parable, may we open our eyes, our hearts to how you want to speak to us, or that we might see you and your presence among us. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Indeed, it is good for us to be together and to hear the word of the Lord proclaimed. And we want to know that we've, we want to know that you're here, that we've been able to have this time together. And so if you will, take out your phone and text the, to the number that's on the screen, or if it's easier, it's also on the front of your worship guide. If you'll just text the word here, or if today is your very first time worshiping with us, either online or in person, 
welcome. We are super delighted that you're here and that we've been able to worship together. And if you would text the word welcome to that number, and that just, it lets us know that we've been together today. And, um, and if you are visiting, it gives us the opportunity to follow back up with you, to continue to tell you about Roswell Prez and, and get to know you a little bit better. Also, there is a QR code in front of you or on the screen, and you can give your offering that way, or there's a basket through the doors as you're leaving if you would like to, to give it that way. But indeed, it's good to be together, and Jeff just gave us so much to think about and to reflect on, and so as we um, sign in and as we contemplate our financial gifts, I also would invite you to take these next moments to think about how is the Spirit calling you to respond to this word of the Lord, and what is it this week that God's asking you to do? So let's take the next few moments to reflect and to respond then. Let's continue to worship. continue to pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for this day, for this time to be together, to be in your presence and to worship. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you have blessed us, the gifts that you have given to us. And so now, Lord, we pray that you would receive the gifts that we are offering, that they would be used to further your kingdom and given to your glory. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's sing our last hymn together in Christ, There Is No East or West.
It's been a joy to be back in worship. I've so been missing being with you. Um, my wife was just on the live stream and uh, she texted me a pic picture. She said, um, we we're totally impressed with your Robert Brazon reference. And then she showed a picture of Mem totally sleeping. So um, <laughs> that's what we're living with here. So uh, it has been a joy. The sower is out there. The sower is sowing seed of the word of God in our lives. Will we have the eyes to see it? It wants to illuminate God's love in our lives and in the world. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love. And all God's people said, amen. amen.